Good afternoon, friends. It's your pal SVH here. And today I'd like to take a little time to talk to you about my book, Mind Over Metal, The Musician's Guide to Mental Mastery. Isn't that a mouthful? All right. And it's also part of the Mystic Art of Self-Discovery series, volume one. <laughs> um, so yeah, yesterday in my testimony video, I talked a little bit about my book. I just kind of briefly mentioned it, but I, I'd like to talk about it a little bit. Um, it's not a sales pitch or anything like that. Um, I very often send this out as a PDF to people if they call and request it. Um, you can purchase it on Amazon. There's also a link below where you can go directly to the publisher site and pick it up. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to talk a little bit about it and kind of tell you what uh, got me inspired to write this book and what it's about. Um, now. I call it the Musician's Guide to Mental Mastery, um, but it's not just for musicians. This is really for anybody who has a creative spirit, an artistic flow um, somewhere, in which we all do. We all have some sort of creative spark within us. And this is really about self-expression. It's a book about finding your note within the symphony of the universe and expressing it. Um, and so that's really what uh, the impetus of this was. Um, I mentioned that I was into martial arts for a long time. I studied Jeet Kune Do, which was Bruce Lee's art. Um, started out with Shaolin Kung Fu back in Ohio. Um, really got good with some weaponry and some nunchucks and swords and things like that. Um, and uh, yeah, really got into a lot of the, ta the Taoist philosophy. And I was really inspired by Bruce Lee. Um, and he had the Tao of Jeet Kune Do, which was kind of like breaking down his art and his, his um, style of martial arts that he created. Um, through the eyes of maybe the Taoist tradition a little bit, um, just in the way that it was kind of laid out and everything, a little bit like the Tao Te Ching. Um, so I was inspired to start my own, uh, write my own book called The Tao of Music. So I started working on this, um, really researching and studying just a lot of different things. Like I said yesterday, why, why do I like Pantera and somebody else likes Pavarotti? Or, you know, why, why is it that I like really heavy, intense music and other people just really love country music? Or um, opera music to me is just, I love classical music, but I can't stand opera. You know, so these kinds of different things, I tried to understand why is that? You know, is it a physiological thing in me? Is it just a mental thing in me? Is it just a hang up? Because I'm a true lover of music and I love all kinds of music, but there are certain things that just kind of, just are abrasive to me and I you know and usually heavy metal which I love and I enjoy um, is abrasive to most people or to a lot of people unless that's your style um, so I, I really wanted to understand that a little bit more and um, I also as I was getting into martial arts um, I really was interested in this idea of chi energy um, ki or chi in Japanese it's ki it's in Chinese it's chi um, but this chi energy that um, is this energy force that's within us that we can move and we can manipulate, you know, and these great masters, you know, they, they really over exaggerate this in a lot of the old Kung Fu movies, but um, not in the Bruce Lee movies because he really did all this. But, you know, the, you know, you look at Bruce Lee and the one inch punch, you know, and to do a punch from an inch, you know, and to have the right force and the right control and the right spin of your body to move one inch and throw somebody 20, 30 feet. Um, that, that takes a concentration of that energy. So you have to find that energy. You have to, you know, find that chi within yourself and direct it and force it through the arm into the target or through the target. Um, so with that being said, I was super intrigued by that. And I was like, why, why don't people apply that to music? You know, you're, you've got all this physicality with your music and your instruments and things like that. Um, so you know, I started doing some crazy stuff when I was really trying to get my voice up to, you know, where I could really scream and yell and, and do it on key and on pitch and, and have some vocality to it as well. And what I used to do is I used to sit in a studio room much like this with a little mixing console behind me and, and some nice speakers. And I would play our, our band's uh, live set, um, you know, recording of it. And I would sing along with it for the hour long set or whatever it is, wearing a 40 pound weight vest. Um, and this weight vest would obviously weigh you down. It made it a lot harder to, you know, take a full chest breath to really use the diaphragm and all these kinds of things. But when I then finished the set with the 40 pound weight vest, I would take the weight vest off and I'd do it again. And that time I would have so much more power, so much more control because I'm not struggling. But, you know, I was building those muscles. I was building the power of the diaphragm, building the muscles in my chest and, you know, shoulders and things like that. Then I got crazy. I got into, you know, the, this whole iron hand kung fu where you, you know, you 
take your hand and you chop it down into a, a bucket of sand for a while and then you move up to like little you know um, fishbowl pebbles and then you move up to little rocks and you know eventually you're you know, punching boulders and hitting trees with your forearm and, and I was doing all that I was going down the street you know hitting trees with my forearm and all this to really um, to build up and strengthen the forearms, the wrists, the motion, you know, in the hands to really where I could have a lot more flexibility, a lot more control in what I was doing with my body. And then I was trying to take that a step further and do the, uh, do the chi energy kind of thing. Man, if I can play a guitar and I can, you know, transfer chi through my hands into my guitar and out through my amp, you know, into an audience, um, you know, if you could really take intention that far, and you can, it, 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 intention works that way. So putting a certain intention behind it and really directing your body's energy um, and moving that flow in a certain way um, was just extremely, extremely intriguing to me. Um, later, I got, I kind of got away from the hitting my forearm on trees and stuff like that because I, I learned that it deadens the nerves. And that's what makes, you know, you have these strong forearms. It's not so much that you're doing it to you know build the strength you're really kind of deadening the nerves so um, I stopped doing that but I think uh, you know the the weight vest and some of those other practices I think were really just intuitive ways that I just worked to kind of create something different so um, with all that said that's kind of a little background in kind of the, how crazy I was about developing myself as this master musician and um, you know I got a long way to go but uh, I've, I've come a long way too so um, mind over metal is really just that it's it's basically finding different ideas different concepts and ways to look at your creative expression it's different ways to um, kind of look at how you would write music how you would approach music um, I go into a lot in this book about the five elements and I talk about writing from the perspective of the five elements you know if you're um, doing a, a fire energy you know it's going to be maybe very aggressive or it's going to have a real you know like a real flashy solo would be almost kind of like a fire energy um, water energy is going to be more soothing and more calming so a nice flute run or some kind of you know um, soft piano part or something like that could very much be written in a water uh, mindset and uh, all these different elements you know really have a different energy and a different effect on the body which is also going to have a different effect on the listener um, so depending on what energy you're, you're going for and also what uh, frequencies that you're using um, you know there was a I probably say his name wrong but Alexander Scriabin, Scriabin uh, was a composer um, many moons ago who worked with sound and uh, he actually met with Hazrat Nayak Khan and uh, they had talked about uh, you know this color variations in sound and things like that and he had a color association with every every note and every tone and he would write um, with this color mindset um, so I mean there's and I talk about color in here and I do mention him um, so yeah there's different ways to approach you know using the elements or using color or using different things that uh, give you a mental association so I just thought I'd take a little moment to talk a little bit about the book I want to share a couple stories from the book and uh, you know again if you're if you're interested the links down below um, you can always reach out to me uh, instant message me or leave a comment down below with your um, with your email address and I'll send you a PDF copy of it um, I just love getting this information out there and I think it's really uh, it's a really it's a fun book so um, one of the stories that I told in this book uh, is called masking tape and masking tape is one of my favorite stories to tell uh, when it comes to music um, so my friend and I uh, my, my very best friend Matt Bennett uh, back in Ohio we were in uh, you know bands for years together he and Sean Lowry uh, my two best friends my, my best mates ever you know these guys are are solid dudes and uh, one day Matt comes into the studio and he's like man something's missing in our guitar tone we're just missing something I, I'm not really 100% sure what it is but we're missing something and so we started listening to a lot of different music and we started really you know listening to a lot of things that influenced us and what we liked about guitar sounds and things like that and we were really into um, I'm still in into the band Carcass uh, so Carcass had this amazing guitar tone and it had this great mid-range lift to it, you know, and um, we were listening to this and, and he, he just kind of had this epiphany. He goes, ah, I know what we need in our sound. We need more masking tape. I just kind of look at him like, what are you smoking, bro? More masking tape? What do you mean? And he goes, you know, have you ever seen those double wide roll of masking tape? So I got a like a, a roll like this, but masking tape, you know, like a double wide roll. 
So when you peel that masking tape off of the roll, it has this kind of sound to it, you know, so it has this, uh, this very interesting tonality to it. So when that happens, there's this mid-range lift that lifts up the tone, you know? And so we sat there for a couple of minutes ripping you know, masking tape off the roll because we had masking tape because we used it for our, um, you know, to label the console and stuff like that. So we ripped these pieces of masking tape off and uh, listened to the sound. And then we went over to our guitar amps and we tried to dial in a little bit more of the masking tape. And I'll be damned, man, it worked. We found our tone, we found our sound, and it was really cool. It was really ex exciting to experience in that way. You know, and as a producer, um, that's something that you have to do a lot. You know, when you're producing music, you have to find creative ways to get everybody to kind of hear what you hear in your own head. Because, um, you know, you got, you know, four or five people that come in in a group and they've all got really strong ideas and they all hear things a certain way, but you can't hear it unless they play it that way. And not all the time that you play something, it's going to come out the way that it hear, you know, that you hear it in your head. So um, it's just a great way to look at a creative way of visualizing a sound, you know, with, with something tangible. So needed more masking tape. That's all it needed. And we figured it out. Um, so that's a story I really love because I, I feel like uh, that's a little secret sauce in my tone. I, um, I've always been a, a tone nerd and I love, you know, like great guitar sound and, you know, especially playing heavy music. A lot of it can just sound like noise unless you really have a great tone and you really work, um, work your magic. So um, yeah, I've got some some gear here and some things that I've worked over the years with, but uh, there's definitely lots of masking tape in my tone these days. So that's one story. Um, let's see, uh, another story that uh, I put in this book, I talk, I have a chapter about attention to detail. Um, and this one's really dear to my heart. And uh, my, my grandfather, uh, Sam Teal, he was an amazing man. And uh, he really taught me a lot. He was probably my first spiritual guide, to be quite honest. Um, you know, he, he always taught me these life lessons. He claimed to be full-blooded Cherokee, uh, and he looked it. And from what I've learned about his, uh, his background and things from his family over the last several years, you know, I definitely believe there's some, some, uh, some weight to that. Um, and, you know, he taught us how to, you know, count in Cherokee and some other things like that. And he always just had these funny one-liners and great things that he said. You know, I, I just, uh, you know, if you would burp or fart, he'd say, man, it sounds a whole lot better since you had it fixed. You know, just little things like that that I just really just love about my grandfather. And, uh, you know, he grew up, he had a car um, a, a company called, not a company, but a, uh, an organization um, called Car Coddlers of Ohio. Um, and it was a car group, um, a, a ownership group for people that had classic cars. Um, and when I say classic cars, I'm talking like Model T's, Model A Fords. Um, my grandfather had a 1921 Willis Overland. Um, really just amazing cars, you know, and that was his specialty. He restored these cars and he restored them better than anybody else. And people came from all over the country to have my grandfather um, restore their cars. And uh, I was probably about eight or nine and I was in the uh, garage with him one day and he was working on, I think a, I think it was a Model T truck or something. It's some kind of a, it, it looked like a truck, but it was an older Model A, Model T, but I was too young to remember now. But um, he kept taking the door off, one of the doors. He'd, he'd go over there and he'd you know, bolt it onto the frame and then he'd close it and open it a couple times and then he'd take it back off and go do something to it, come back and do it. And after about four or five times of this, I, I was just like, what the hell is he taking the door off for? This makes no sense. I said, Grandpa, what do you, why do you keep taking that door off of there? What, what are you doing? And he says, come here, son, I want to show you something. Come here. So he goes back over bolts the door back onto the thing after he just took it off just to show me this lesson that's just how how generous a man he was how compassionate um and patient because <laughs> i was a little hyperactive kid remember um so he he went back over and bolted the door back onto the uh to the car and he shut the door and he opened it back up a few times and shut it and he goes now look here son you see this pin striping on the door? Now you see where the body here is and the door meets the, the, the body of the car when I shut that door? If you hold a dime up to that pin stripe, it's a half a dime's thickness off in alignment. And I looked at, I looked at him like he was just nuts. And I was like, a half a dime's thickness? Are you kidding me? Who in the hell is going to see a half a dime's thickness that I, I can't even see it myself and you're holding a dime up to it. He literally pulled a dime out of his pocket and showed me. 
And I now so understand that was his level of attention to detail. You know, if and he, and, and his answer was, well, son, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it right the first time, you know. And um, that was such a, a, an extreme life lesson for me, you know. And um, so I'm in no way a perfectionist when it comes to my music or recording or things like that. I like things to be natural and loose and things like that. It doesn't all have to be pristine and perfect. But I certainly look at the attention to detail. Um, and this carries into so many aspects of my music expression. If I'm going to be doing a word and I'm going to say something about rising up or, or raising something, I try to go up with the note instead of down with the note because you're, you're only enhancing with the tonality what you're speaking and what you're saying. Um, obviously, if you're going to say something where you want to show aggression, you're going to use an aggressive tone. Um, if you're going to say something soft, you want to use a soft tone. So all these types of things really go into the detail and the attention that you put into every single um, note of music that you make or every single piece of art that you create, um, everything that you express. If you really put an attention to detail into it, that becomes part of your makeup. It becomes part of who you are. And then everything that you do has that attention to detail just naturally built into it. And uh, you can't go wrong with that when you have that level of... Um, attention to detail it just again it becomes natural and it becomes a part of your natural expression so um, really grateful for that lesson that I learned and uh, I do share that in the book here when I talk about attention to detail um, there's another story in here that I'm going to share and I'm actually going to read this one because um, this was more of an experience the other two were very personal and they're just they're just stories I can tell from my life um, this was something that happened on a on a particular day and the way that I wrote it in this book was so poetic I don't think I could ever memorize it and speak it off the cuff <laughs> quite as well as I wrote it in the book so I'm just going to read it directly from the book um, but this is this is kind of more of a, a a visual that I got and it was kind of more of an epiphany that I had um, during this little experience so here you go um, and this is in the chapter, which chapter is this in? Um, this is in my chapter called TNT, Unleashing the Explosive Technicality of Technique. <laughs> I think that's where it's at. Yeah. Okay. So, one day, I was at a friend's house waiting by the pool for him to come outside. I noticed at the bottom of the pool a very large shadow of something moving, and it looked like a huge alien bug through the ripples and curls, and I was unsure what was creating it. A few minutes later, I saw a small honeybee swimming across the surface of the water, and as I watched it swim, I saw my alien shadow on the bottom moving accordingly. So it was the sun reflecting on, let me get this right, so it was the sun reflecting on the bee that was treading the surface of the water and reflecting a huge shadow in the depths of the pool. At that moment, I saw a beautiful example of the mind-body-spirit connection and how it relates to what we reflect in the pool of life. The light of the sun shines down upon a small soul struggling against the ripples of the water, reflecting deep in the depths a larger shadow. It's like the light of the heart that shines from the true self as we ride the waves of life, reflecting in the depths a larger self that is being shadowed by the small self that we associate ourselves with. It also shows that what is on the surface is much smaller and what is, than what is in the depths. When the light of the universe shines, upon, shines deep in the depths of the human mind, body, and spirit, a higher self is illuminated. So yeah, it was a trip. I was just standing there and I saw this big, you know, shadow in the bottom of the pool and I was like, what is creating? I'm looking up in the sky and everything else. And then I see this little honeybee just floating across the water, just trying to, you know, get himself. And eventually I netted him out and, and saved him from drowning. But <laughs> um, at the moment I had this, just this whole realization of, you know, the mind, body, spirit connection and how thing, you know, the, the light of the divine, you know, shines down upon us and we're this little soul struggling, you know, but in the depths there's something much greater. Um, and the depths of our being, you know, and there's a lot to be said about the shadow and I know I related this to a shadow and things like that So I'm not trying to confuse, you know, shadow work and, and that type of thing with this But uh, but yeah, I thought it was just a great analogy and just you know That's kind of how my my mind works sometimes I'll be out and I'll see something and I'll be like, oh gee That kind of makes me think this, you know, and um, this one was worth jotting down. So uh, yeah, like I said, I, I uh, 
appreciate you letting me read it instead of just telling it off the top of my head because I never would have said it that that well. <laughs> um, yeah, a couple, a couple of the other things I get into in here, I get into this, this thing about unraveling. Um, one of my first lessons um, that I had at my, my uh, teacher's house, um, she talked about unraveling and how we create these knots in our head and every thought that we have, every, every concept that we put together, um, all the conditioning and the programming that happens to us by our, our parents, our family, our schools, our environment, our friends, um, you know, they all create um, a knot, um, you know, and so we have this direct thread, you know, from our heart to the divine. Uh, it's a direct thread. It's a golden thread that comes from your heart to God's heart. Um, that thread is connected. Everyone has that thread. Um, but what happens is you, you know, you have this concept or idea, you're going to fail. You just tied a knot. You're going to, you know, you're not good enough. Tie another knot. Um, you know, you're going to hell because you don't believe my religion. Tie another knot. And so all these knots create these, these blockages. And so now, you know, we have to go through this process of unlearning and unraveling these knots so that that thread, again, connects directly to the divine. Um, because when the knot is there, you know, you only get so far and then you hit a knot and then you can't go past the knot. And sometimes the knot gets so big and so big that you don't even see what's at the end of it anymore. You don't even see where that thread connects. And that's when people lose their faith. That's when people lose their belief. That's when people start saying, ah, I don't believe in God. There's no God. It's a hooey hooey in the sky, whatever. But when you really search your heart and you really start to unravel things in your own life, then you start to see, wow, I'm really unraveling that thread that connects me to the divine. And um, yeah, I think that's such an important, important lesson. So I go into that a little bit here about unraveling. And um, I actually have a song that's, that I'm working on that'll be coming out shortly called Unraveling. And uh, you know, it's just that same concept. You know, this is all, um, you know, all expression of you know, these lessons and things that I've learned. And, you know, when you can translate that into art, it's a beautiful thing. And hopefully the intention that I put into it, the energy that I put into it, you know, speaks to people as they listen to it. And then they decide, you know, hey, I think I'm going to start unraveling some of these knots for myself. So um, that was a little bit about the unraveling part. Uh, let's see, what else can I get into here? Uh, I don't really want to talk about it too much more, but I just kind of wanted to give a little bit of a... Uh, um, you know, a little bit of commentary on some of the stories. Those are just a, a few of the stories that are in the book. Um, there's a lot of great sayings and quotes in here. Um, I'll just share a couple of those with you. Um, so let me run through the chapters real quick with you so you kind of know what's in here. Um, and I wrote this to all of you and everyone else in honor of all those who spread truth, dedicated to all who seek it. May peace and harmony be with you along the pathway of your journey. So that's my hope for you. Uh, whether you read this book or not, that's my hope for you. Um, chapter one, shining light on the dark ages, the history and evolution of metal. Mind control is uh, number two, unlocking the power of the mind. And here's where we talk a little bit about how all those kind of thoughts and all those different things kind of create who we are in our mind. And then we got to go back and kind of unlearn so that we can have the purity of mind and the clearness of mind to not be controlled by outside influences. Uh, conjuring the spirit, this is awakening the spirit within. Uh, the warrior within, embracing your individuality, the alchemy, the, the, the alchemy of artistry, transforming your rock into metal. Um, this is a really cool one. This is where I get into the whole thing with the art, the um, the different uh, elements, the five elements, and the destructive cycle, and the natural cycle, and uh, all these types of things. Uh, you get, I get into some really cool stuff. I've got some charts here. I kind of show you the the notes and where they correlate to um, the different parts of the spine and curvature and how all that ties in. We get into the law of the five elements. Um, yeah, this is a, it's a really cool chapter. Um, you know, in alchemy, that's it, right? It, it, what is alchemy? It's tra transforming base metals into precious metals, and usually base metals into gold is how it's really said. So that's that's the process that we go through in meditation and in spiritual practice. Um, the, the base metal is the base of your spine, the lowest part, you know, and it's just this crude, hard, you know, uh, stone-like um, thing, you know, <laughs> um, and that's, that's the base metal. 
And through the pra practice of prayer, through the practice of working and meditating and opening up the different chakras, the different energy centers, we work to where we come all the way up to the crown and we open up that golden light from the divine that comes in and pours through us and illuminates our heart. And uh, that's, that's the alchemical transformation. You know, a lot of times you hear about alchemy and it's talked about in a very, um, a very uh, literal way. Uh, but, you know, these, these were teachings, deep mystical teachings, when they got into talking about alchemy and transformation in that way. But you know what? I think we're all looking forward to an RV. I think we're all looking forward to uh, some, uh, maybe some gold standard. And if that's the case, then we're really going to turn some base metals into gold and some junky fiat into gold, right? So <laughs> that's our hope. So uh, the alchemy of artistry. Um, exploring the dungeons, this is the art of drop tunings, so I get into a lot about drop tunings. Um, I use flat wound strings on my guitar, which is really odd, they're like jazz strings, but I use them for heavy metal, and so I get into some of that and why I do it. Um, let's see, uh, the primal scream, which is hearing your inner voice. So this is kind of really working with, you know, attuning yourself to what you're trying to express and trying to create through your art. Um, let's see. Voices in the Dark, this is illuminating the color of sound. This is a really interesting chapter. I've written a couple blogs and articles um, for a couple guitar uh, websites and magazines over the years where I, I pretty much just verbatim use this particular chapter because um, it really gets into the colorfulness of sound. We talk about color of sound. Um, you know, why is it called the blues? You know, uh, why is blue associated with that? Black metal, where does that come from? It's about the blackness and the lack of light um, that goes into that particular sound. Um, so these types of things, there, there are color associations with different, uh, different sounds and also different styles of music, but also just the, the art of expression, you know, has these different color associations as well. And that's where I talk about Scriabin and all that as well. Um, let's see, the speed demon, the science of shredding. So I get in a little bit about the physiology of things like I talked about with the, you know, how I built my hands up and did the weight vest and some things like that. Um, these are just different things that you can do to build up your physicality so that you can actually play better, play stronger, play faster, play smoother, those types of things. Um, TNT, the unleashing the explosive technicality of technique. I got into that a little bit before. Um, the Army of Darkness, Aligning the Creative Forces. And I use a lot of heavy metal puns in my titles and stuff like that. Um, this is aligning your creative forces. So this is kind of like, okay, now that I've got this idea and I've got this concept, I've got the sound thing and I've got the, uh, or I'm sorry, the color thing associated with the sound. And now I've got um, uh, an element that I'm associating with the sound and a certain energy and a certain intention that I'm associating with the sound. So now how do I put all this together so that it actually comes out the way I want it to? So that's what that chapter is about. Um, Creating a monster, this is strengthening mind, body, and spirit. So this is really just, you know, putting, building yourself into a spiritual monster, you know. Um, and I mean that in a good way, not in a negative way. Again, lots of puns. Um, there's some humor in this. <laughs> as, you'll, as you'll learn uh, along our journey together, I have some jokes. Not all of them are good jokes. A lot of them are dad jokes, but I got some jokes. Um, the wise speak. Uh, this is affirmations and words to live by. So I'm going to share a couple of these. They're kind of spattered, scattered throughout the book. And then at the end, uh, I have these in here. So um, what's a really good one? Alchemy is the art of manipulating life and consciousness and matter to help it evolve or to solve problems of inner disharmonies. So that's from John Dubois. Uh, Ludwig von Beethoven. Er von Beethoven. Music is the mediator between the spiritual and the sensual life. Music is the mediator between the spiritual and the sensual life. I love that. Um, our good friend, the green man, Master Yoda. Do or do not. There is no try. Right? Um, there's a really great one in here. Um, let's see. My peer, Hazrat Naik Khan. It is the state of vibrations to which a man is tuned that accounts for his soul's note. I put it in here first because that's my work right there. <laughs> that's, that's the whole thing of my, my work. Uh, a great quote from one of my favorite bands, Tool. Overthinking, overanalyzing separates the body from the mind. So a lot of times we just rationalize out, you know, this connection that we have to intuitively play. Um, Bruce Lee, don't think, feel. This is what is known as emotional content. Uh, there's one in here in particular that I want to find. Uh, 
um, from the Tao Te Ching, from Lao Tzu. He who knows others is learned. He who knows himself is wise. It's a good one. Um, there's one in particular that's really... Oh, oh yeah, here we go. Leopold Stik... I know I'm going to say this wrong. Leopold Stokowski. A painter paints pictures on canvas, but musicians paint their pictures in silence. Or on silence, sorry. <laughs> a painter paints pictures on canvas, but musicians paint their pictures on silence. I love that. that that's a powerful quote. Um, so anyway, I won't go through too much. Oh, I'll tell you one more. One more great Bruce Lee one, because I'm going to talk about this in other videos. Bruce Lee says, I fear not the man who has practiced 10,000 kicks once, but I fear the man who has practiced one kick 10,000 times. Now that's powerful. So you can, as a musician, you can change kicks for licks. You know, you can play 10,000 different licks and be kind of good because you got all these different licks in your arsenal. Or you can find that one solo or that one scale and master it and master it and master it to where when you play that scale, people are going to be like, oh my goodness, did you hear the power that just came out of that dude's fingers? You know, so that was kind of the idea and impetus behind that. So at any rate, that's it, man. I just wanted to take a few minutes to share a little bit about my book, Mind Over Metal. Uh, I'm definitely going to get into a lot more of these concepts. We might go over different chapters and kind of just, you know, break it apart a little bit if it's relevant over some of the course of these uh, little discourses that I like to do. But uh, yeah, I just want to take a minute and share that with you guys. Encourage you to check it out. Again, it's called Mind Over Metal, The Musician's Guide to Mental Mastery. This is part one of the Mystic Art of Self-Discovery series. I put this out in 2008. So this is, and it's been revised a couple times. I think I re redid it in um, 2012 and kind of updated it and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I'm working on a new one right now. I'm working on uh, my memoir. Um, it's going to be volume two and uh, the mystic in the mosh pit. So keep your eyes out for that one. Um, it's just going to tell a little bit about my story and go into some of my life experience. And um, I think it's going to be an interesting, interesting book for people to read. Um, hopefully <laughs> we'll see how it turns out. Uh, but yeah, mind over metal. Uh, you can find it on Amazon. You can find the link below. Um, if you uh, don't want to purchase it, but you're really, really interested or you're hard on money and you can't really afford it right now, which I know so many people are, just shoot me a message and, I'll, and with your uh, email and I'll email you a PDF copy of it. How's that? All right. So thank you guys. I appreciate, um, again, everybody taking the time to tune into these videos. Make sure you hit the like and subscribe button below. Hit that notification bell so you make sure you don't miss a thing. And we'll be back with another one soon. May you be blessed and Happy New Year, my friends.